state is less than perfect, but we do have our faults and I feel sure our virtues. As for our virtues, we'll let a, another man praise us and not we ourselves. That's the phrase I came across while doing research for Simon in the Game of Chance, a verse in the Bible. In the story, I used a Bible quoting Father, who was a new fanatic on the subject of religion. In fact, one adult accused me of presenting in the story a negative view of Bible Belt Christianity, but I hope I didn't. I tried to show the misuse of dogma and its effect on the lives of the people touched by it. But I've discovered that referring to anything having to do with religion is a quick way to draw criticism. In Tyler Wilkin and Ski, I used an old game that we used to play as children, and I'm sure many of you have played it also, asking and answering questions with him titles. Well, in one chapter, I have Tyler and his brothers playing the game, and in one instance, the question is, what shall I do to be saved? Tyler asked it, and his younger brothers Wilkin and Ski, using also a hymn title answer, Rescue the Parish. Well, one very pious gentleman scolded me after the book was published. He said that the Bible clearly states that man is saved by faith alone. So I personally have always put a lot of stock in, and faith in people who rescue the perishing, but I explained to the man that in presenting that in the story, I didn't intend to show it as anything more than an answer that the two boys thought appropriate. And the man said, well, in that case, he guessed it was all right if my purpose was to show that Wilkin and Ski were weak in theology. <laughs> Back to our having, our having faults or shortcomings as citizens, we are naturally concerned about all our problems, but at the same time, we are more directly concerned with some than others. For instance, the rising rate of venereal disease in the nation is a serious matter, but I'm afraid we'll have to leave it to health services and penicillin to try to bring it under control, but on other matters, hopefully, we are in better position to be of more help. For example, in anything having to do with illiteracy, the percentage of dropouts in this country and the number of functional illiterates in our supposedly enlightened times and in our affluent society, you and I are in a very real position to make a contribution, involved as we are in trying to bring books and children together Anything having to do with reading is part of our responsibility. In effect, it belongs on our corner of the house top. That's another Bible verse I came across in my research, and I promise it'll be the last one I'll use this evening. On problems of children and their reading, sociologists probably have many reasons why youngsters in this country are not the readers we wish they were. I personally lay part of the blame on our good weather. I compared notes with an English friend once about the books we had each read in growing up, and his reading had been much more extensive than mine had. I could, and I'm afraid did, spend whole summers reading no more than one or two books, which were probably the only ones I'd read the summer before, while he had read endlessly. And then we talked on about other things we had done in our boyhood, and all, and all. I learned that where he lived, there were about two weeks during the summer when the weather was right for swimming. So I told him it was no wonder he'd read all those books. The climate wasn't fit for anything else. <laughs> Another thing that may have kept us from becoming a nation of readers is our rural background, which is not to say that people don't read as much, often more in the country as in the city. But most of us, or our people ahead of us, did earn our living from the soil, and we had to work so hard at it, there wasn't a lot of time or energy left for anything else. Then later, of course, the Depression hit all of us, and we've been a long time in recovering, but recovering we are, and along with improvements to our economy since then, equally exciting are the changes that have taken place in our attitude toward education. There was a time when many of us didn't place it very high on our scale of values. Grandpa signed his name with X's, so why should we worry about reading and writing? But all that is changing, and you and I must not only keep pace, but help say we must do all that we can to stimulate an interest in books by children. It's a challenge in one place in which I feel an effort is being made to meet the challenges in the field of realism for young students. I'm going to dwell mostly on realism tonight because it's the area in which I work primarily. 
I started to say the area that interests me most, but all kinds of stories interest me. Fantasy, for example, I enjoy very much. So much can be said in it and in such an entertaining way that I'm enormously envious of the people who can write. But getting back to realism, one of the ways realistic stories have changed in recent years is to become realistic. That sounds silly, doesn't it? But it's true, you've only to look back a few years at stories that were presented to children as being realistic and see what you think. I don't think I've ever made a talk in which I haven't quoted C.S. Lewis, and if you won't mind, I'll do it again. He was discussing fantasy in an essay, but he touched on realism, saying, I think what profess to be realistic stories for children are far more likely to deceive them than fantasy. I never expected the real world to be like the fairy tales. I think I did expect school to be like the school stories. The fantasies did not deceive me. The school stories did. I agree with his views on realism of the past, and I expect you do also, but aren't you glad there have been such changes in the few years since that essay was written that today the acceptable realistic stories do not deceive the reader. They literally are more realistic. Surely in earlier years, children didn't believe that life was as tidy a package as it was presented in their stories or the problems always worked out and had, had the solutions. Don't get me wrong, I'm not against happy endings in life. Surely there are more happy endings than sad ones, so to be truly realistic, shouldn't books average out the same? But I think it's good for a child in opening a book that nowadays he knows he'll be treated with some respect and that no one has got to manipulate a story so that it will end happily just for him. We insulted his intelligence in earlier years to do this, and at the same time we took away part of the suspense. If on page one, the goal of the hero was to obtain a red wagon, the reader knew that in the end he would obtain a red wagon. It was not a matter of if, but how. To uh, for a escape fair on occasion, that sort of story is all right. It's something of the same principle as our reading adult mysteries, we know the murderer will be apprehended, but we read on to find out how. Still, I'm glad that when I set out to write a junior novel, I don't have to guarantee the reader I'll contrive a plot till it works out to a pad ending. I'll make every effort to see that this story grows as naturally as possible out of character development and the circumstances of the time and place in which the story is set. If it works out to a happy ending, fine. If it doesn't, that's okay, too. That's not to say that I approve of terribly negative endings. I think that a children's book should end on a positive note. For example, in the illustration I used just then, if the boy has not obtained his wagon, I don't want him or me, if I'm reading this story, to feel really defeated. I like to feel at the end of a story of that type that he's going to roll up his sleeves and continue the struggle until he does obtain one. Or preferably that maybe his values have changed along the way and he has his sights on something higher, maybe not even a material possession. I think that in stories it's right to include problems, no matter how serious the young people face today. I don't think anything that could happen to children should have to be left out of their stories. It hadn't been too long that even we adults could discuss things openly. Celestine Sibley of the Atlanta Constitution was telling me that until fairly recently, newspaper, newspapers couldn't use the word rape. It was criminal assault. Well, many things could be criminal assault. And what was to be gained by sheltering us from specific terms, I don't know. We would utter bromides like the truth never hurts and then veil the truth with vague terms. And I don't know for what purpose, if it would have helped to, or if it would help to eliminate the offense to which it was applied, that maybe would have been justification, but it only hindered discussion. We shouldn't be so delicate that anything that ha can happen can't be discussed. In some instances, discussion might lead to prevention, but how could anything be prevented, or how could prevention of anything be realized if the concern cannot be labeled what it is? Getting back to children's books today, Almost anything that can be a part of the child's world can be a part of the child's story, and that's as it should be. We don't want to frighten children with tales of despair, and I certainly hope there'll always be room for funny stories, wild, zany ones at that. But there's also room for grim reality, which we know exists. 
I'm sure that many of you read The Egypt Game. It was published in 1967, and it's a beautifully written story with such interesting characters and action, the reader's drawn into it immediately. In the background is the threat of a child molester who has taken the lives of children in the community already. In earlier years, that book, I'm afraid, wouldn't have been acceptable, but anyone who has ever had a child who was molested had rather the youngster had come across such an action in a book rather than in real life. If we could say, safeguard all children from such acts, we could leave any reference to them out of their stories, but until we can, I think we've matured in accepting books like The Egypt Game. A new book this year is I Would Rather Be a Turnip. I expect so many of you have read that by Bob Vera and Bill Cleaver, who wrote of Where the Lilies Bloom, which was one of my top favorites, is one of my top favorites of recent years. But uh, the new book has a comic side and a serious side. I think sometimes the most effective stories presenting grave situations do contain funny incidents. Maybe the humorous parts contrast with the serious ones in both the sharp ones. The central character in the Cleavers new book is a 12-year-old with all the problems of adolescence plus one, and that is that an eight-year-old nephew has come to live with her family and she resents him bitterly, knowing from the start that he's going to interfere with her social life. He has been born out of wedlock to an older sister who has moved away, but the hostile, uncharitable attitudes of the people in the community are remembered. Eight years later, the return of the nephew is almost more than the central character can tolerate. In addition to being an embarrassment to her, he also is a pest with traits she considers tedious, one of them being that he reads books. Nothing, nothing he does pleases her, and she is unhesitant and sharp-tongued in telling him so. She calls him a sissy because he likes flowers, and he says that yes, he likes flowers, and if he couldn't be who he was, he believed he could rather be a flower than anything else, and there's a fun scene in which he tries to decide which flower he could rather be. Then he asks her to pick the one she would like to be, and her answer is, I would rather be a turnip. Later, when she's wiser in thinking back about some of the narrow, hypocritical people of the community, she says to herself that rather than be like them, she would indeed rather be a turnip. I couldn't help notice in th that in the story, the accurate word to describe the illegitimate child was never used, although it was referred to several times. I somehow feel that even the term should not have been glossed over, and I'd be interested in how you feel about this. Used in context, the word bastard would not teach children anything that youngsters don't already know, and the fact that some youngsters suffer the humiliation of being tormented by it seems to me to be justification, justification, excuse me, to show the reader, in the dramatic situation of a good story, how cruel he is to ever call anyone by. And I think that parents or teachers who think their children don't know and sometimes use such words are naive. It was effective, and I would rather be a turn but the name calling was not done by, by roughneck boys nor ghetto children, but by adolescent middle class girls. I'd be interested in your views and how far you feel a story that young people should go in being realistic. I think maybe it can be carried too far at times. At times, one children's book I read recently showed the seamy side of Chicago in several, in several instances, children are pickpockets. Well, those were, uh, were so graphically described, those incidents, that the chapters could almost be used as a pickpocket manual. But I think the child who would likely be involved in such activities seldom involved in reading books. As a sidelight, maybe that's one benefit we all would gain in getting uh, more children interested in reading, even if they got nothing else from it, they would be out of mischief while they were doing it. But I'm glad there are more noble reasons for reading programs. In deciding what is or is not appropriate to discuss with children, there are no clear-cut answers. I expect people in sex education discovered this before we did. Did you happen to read Irma? Bombeck's column a while back when she had decided to teach her children about the miracle of birth. So she bought them um, an aquarium of guppies, or a tank of a, of a guppies. And a few weeks later, her little girl said, yes, she had learned about birth from the guppies, but how did you decide which babies to eat? And 
so the uh, Ms. Bombeck replaced the guppies then with seahorses, uh, where the male, through some strange quirk in nature, is the one who gets pregnant, and her son learned his lesson. He's, he said that he wouldn't mind having babies if he had to, but he didn't believe he could tread water that long. <laughs> But you know, modern, uh, modern views on sex education are affecting even, even picture, book, picture books as to whether they will help or confuse the child, I don't really know. Of course, there are other things that have to be discussed nowadays, whether we like talking about them or not. The drug problem is perhaps the most serious, ones, most, most serious one that most of our young people face today, and we should do anything we can to help them understand it. Have I read some stories on drugs in which the authors give valid information, but the stories themselves have been dull with uh, flat characters in contrived situations. So the cause of reading is not helped in those cases. Uh, in such instances, why not offer straightforward nonfiction books on the subject rather than trying to disguise the information? I think that the entertainment value has got to come first in a story, whether it's a junior novel or one for adults. Or maybe we adults occasionally read novels for some local purpose or moral uplift, but I think a child reads to be entertained. Of course, they occasionally read a book or a story because the teacher or the librarian has assigned it or suggested it to them, but we're all losers unless we can persuade them to also read books on their own for the joy of reading or to discover the pleasure in reading. And although the child doesn't consciously realize that he gets more from a good story than entertainment, maybe not always something that will help him on tomorrow's examination, although I'm convinced that the reading for pleasure builds a better vocabulary faster than any number of white book exercises or vocabulary drills, maybe, maybe because there's no strain. Maybe we all learn more when we're not trying. The problem with drugs, of course, is of concern to all of us, and it's only natural that it find its way into juvenile novels if fiction is to reflect life. However, the subject has always, not, or excuse me, has not always been of major concern, while some problems of the past are less than vital now. Others, it would seem to me, remain constant, although you might disagree with me. A good friend disagreed with me when I mentioned to her that I was working on a story for high school youngsters in which there's a teenage pregnancy. She told me I couldn't use it, and I said, but it isn't being bold nowadays to use such situations and stories. And my friend said, yes, that's what she meant. It was not bold enough. She argued that today's young readers would not be interested if they would even be scornful of the girl's problem because they know too much about the pill and about abortion. I argued that only a small segment of the population would be that worldly wise and that they were super sophisticated anyway and should read Cosmopolitan and grow up to be Helen Gurley Brown. I insisted that there are many youngsters to whom unwanted pregnancy is certainly still a major dilemma. And my friend granted that I was right, but she insisted that nevertheless, in the broad spectrum, the situation is generally regarded as a dating. I don't think she's right, although I somehow wish she were. Last fall, I was invited to take part in a panel discussion at the National Council of Teachers of English, the title of which was Violence in Children in Children's Books. Some of you may have been at the meeting. At first, I had de declined the invitation, thinking that a wrong choice had been made in including me in what I thought would be talks on riots and campus unrest. But the program chairman explained that the aim of the program was to explore ways of helping children through books to understand their deeper feelings. She said that she thought of me in connection with it while reading Simon in the Game of Chance, in which I show the hostility of a boy toward his father, hatred to be more specific. In the story, I didn't set out to show a child-parent relationship almost the opposite of the one that I had used in Queenie Peavy, but it worked out that way. Queenie was fiercely loyal to her father and hostile to everyone else she knew throwing rocks at and spitting tobacco juice on a number of them just to prove. But Skinny, then, and other of my characters, was the product or a victim of a more violent background, in a sense, than either Simon or Queenie, 
and somehow managed not to hate anybody. Let me tell you of a personal experience that has to do with violence in children and children's books. Last summer, an eight-year-old boy moved into my neighborhood as the foster child of a family across the street. And as there were no children his age in our neighborhood, he began spending part of every day with me. I confess he was not drawn as much to me as he was the cats in our yard and a case of Pepsi Colas he had spotted on the back porch. But he was unusually bright, but a poor reader, I soon discovered, so I launched something of a summer reading program, and I don't know that his skills were improved, but I may have learned a bit. And we did not always like the same books. One day, after reading the part in Henry Huggins, where the squad car is described, I asked this youngster if he had ever seen inside a police car, and he said yes, he had even ridden in one. And when I asked when he had had this opportunity, his, his answer was, one of the times my mother got beat up. Well, we went back to reading Henry Huggins, which, by the way, was one of the books we both liked. But I couldn't help thinking that with his background, it was no wonder some of the stories we had read together had failed to reach him. This kid knew violence firsthand, and while I would hate for him to be given only stories about the background that he knew too well, I do favor what May Hill Albert not called a franker treatment of the grave and often tragic social problems that children themselves encounter. I'm pleased about it, and I'm pleased about other trends, trends in children's literature. I'm even happy that Women's Lib is finding fault with children's books. No doubt you've read some of the articles on the subject. One of them appeared in uh, the Library Journal January, I mean January 15th issue. I happened to have been in New York when the article was presented earlier as part of a media program on sexism in children's books, it was sponsored by the Authors Guild and the Children's Book Council. And when I received a notice of it, I thought, what kind of wild nonsense is this? But I thought I'd go and find out, and down deep I didn't mind that children's stories were coming under fire by the movement. I sidetrack a bit and tell you why it has to do with a visit I made to Ohio State University all spring a year ago. Some of you know all Charlotte Huck. I'm sure she's one of the professors there, but she had asked me to visit her classes while she attended IRA, IRA and I was delighted to accept I was not delighted when the time came for me to be there that it was at the height of the trouble on the campus. In fact, the day I finished there, the students were sent home for two weeks. Dr. Huff told me afterwards that she had not meant for me to shut down the campus. But while, while I was there, most of the buildings were picketed. Protesters were denying entrance to them by students and faculty members, except the education building where our sessions on children literature will be in hell. No one ever tried to keep me or anybody else out of it, and I somehow felt cheated. The, the rioters didn't consider the School of Education or the field of children's books a serious enough matter to worry about. I came away thinking that I had rather be fired on than ignored, so <laughs> that explains why I was happy that Women's Lib was going to attack children's books and with a jazzy title including sexism in it, I wasn't about to miss the show. I confess that I went to laugh at the participants, but instead I laughed with them. Their program was done with such good humor, and they had researched the matter so carefully that they really made friends. Have a look at the uh, Library Journal article in the event you haven't read it. Also, the letters to the editor a few uh, months later, one of them was from Natalie Savage Carlson, who said that the term sex sexism gave her a wanton feeling, and that if anyone had called her a sexist when she was growing up, her father would have had to have been dealt with. But times change, and in the area of realism, for young readers, I'm pleased that the changes have brought about a more forthright approach. I think we're fortunate in the children's book field that we no longer have to sweeten our style or stick to a narrowing range of material as we were accused of doing only a few years ago. If a realistic story is to be honest, it seems to me that we underestimate the child or overestimate society and human nature if we dare not tell it like it is, if you'll forgive me for using that overworked but useful modern phrase. Maybe you'd prefer that I go back to the Bible. 
in any event, we owe our reader the truth as we see it whenever we present a tale to him as being we are realistic. And if we are honest with him, maybe we can get his attention. And then if we can just hang in there and hold his attention, there's no telling what we can do. That's why I'm excited about the things that are happening now. And who knows for what some of them will help us in getting more children to read more books. Thank you. Did you want to ask me questions? But also, don't anybody feel that you need to stay? But if any of you would like to visit or visit, did you have questions? I believe we're going to have a coffee session afterwards. Uh, all right, wait, did anybody care to ask a question or tell, tell me what kind of books to go home and work on or what I'm doing wrong or whatever? Anybody? All right, fine. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's uh, mill around then. And Oh. You, you've been a good audience. Let me ask, uh, make this bargain with you. Before, thank you. Before we part, and that is that I'll continue to try to write books if you'll continue to encourage children to read. Okay.